Okay. Glad we're back, KL, after too long. Thank you so for tell having us, we're gonna, me. We're going to launch straight into Saffron Songs and the body of work that we see around us. So maybe we can just start by saying why Saffron Songs and how does this body of work relate to music and yeah, sounds? I started this work several years ago. Three, maybe. Um, it started with this series of conversations I had with my relatives about my grandfather. Um, I've never met him. I know him only from, from this one photograph. These conversations that I had, mostly in Punjabi, opened up this, this, this interest in me about, and uh, that led to this exhibition. So the sound of the language, mm. the sounds in which that connection was being made, the space was being created to connect us, you know, the her voice and me listening opened up through the material nature of sound, through the echo, through the rhythmic nature, through the through the vibrations of the Punjabi language to a peculiar and special new way of knowing the world. You mm. know, and I wanted to use this this anxious, this restless, promiscuous nature of sound to open up new ways, open up a way to understand our contemporary world, the, the multiple perspectives that mm. exist within it. You know, so it, it occurred to me that. The nature of the way we express ourselves, the way we connect with each other, we open up spaces to connect with each other, occurs through sound. Of course. And that yeah. that became the underlying the, basis of this show. Of this show. Okay, so I know we were, we were looking at the work and we were sort of saying, you know, I made the work with a lot of with the sound in mind. And as a result of that, it was very gestural. There's a lot of there's an energy that sort of goes. Into that. Can you just share about you know share with us about how how that how that happened and how the in, in a lot of the paintings there are, there are diptychs. So there, there's the, the painting aspects and then there are the line aspects and the gap between the line painting and the actual painting of the figures and gestures. Oh. Maybe we could just expand a bit about that. So, as you many of these paintings are diptychs, uh, there was a, a deliberate decision to do that. And I want to. Uh, there are three elements, although they are diptychs, there are three elements to each, to each piece. First, within my project uh, that I chose to call Saffron Sonics, I collected set sounds from this, this, this extended period of interviews that I conducted. I collected set of sounds that I thought represent the nature of my history and my culture. I come okay. from the premise that each sound carries with it the whole history and culture. So I use that and I and and, and I feel I feel the cavity of my city and my body with this sound that was creating these works. So one part of each diptych is a what looks like a set of scratchings on canvas. It's, it looks like an automatic whiting, long tradition in art history that, that I explored by playing some of the sounds within me. I wanted to see how they, what kind of visual marks that comes to me while I'm making this one, mm. this, uh, listening mm. to the songs. The, so the diptych, each diptych here is a, it's kind of like a a massive score, massive colorful complex score of the set of sounds that are chose for Saffron Sonics. Mm. You know? And separating these marks from the main painting is a, a gap, a gap of canvas unprimed, untouched, set for uh, the old mark. And then the main piece is when you when you see it, you'll see large, deliberate, rushed, violent, emotional brushstrokes. 
that depicts a similar painting of uh, of, of people moving, gesturing uh, in a in a violent, emotional way. And these these paintings were painted quickly in, in, with with large brush strokes, and I would put everything into them. Very emotional, very tiring to make. And I had several of this going on in the studio at the same time. And, and the brushes were loaded with pigment and I, and I pretty much attacked them with these brushes and, and, and created the figures. There were a lot of mistakes, a lot of canvases mm. thrown. Many of these canvases have been used and reused and there are several different paintings behind them. There's a lot of that energy came from the way I made them. It came with the way I approach problem solving on the canvas. Mm. The way I, I made a mark and continued beyond that, responding to that mark, making the next mark, and so on and so forth. So big brush, loaded canvas, lots of pigment, and and the way I moved across the canvas, the way I solved solved across the canvas and then to the next canvas, layer after layer using acrylic. Uh, because it dried quickly and allowed me to go on to the next layer quickly. Mm. But also, I mean, you were saying that, you know, a lot of these images are sort of reminiscent of some classical Western painting, um, but they are obviously not exact replicas of a particular painting. It's almost sort of like uh, you having been exposed to the same thousands of these images, of classical images, Baroque images, paintings, and then coming up with uh, with what you see here. So could you just maybe share a bit about that. So I've been making art for the last uh, several years on the in the hope that I can I can get people to start thinking about what is it that's colonized their bodies? What is shaping them? What is creating the space for them? What's what's influencing their bodies? And I want you to, uh, or want you through my art, to start thinking about uh, what has colonized the body. So, self-reflection and decolonization is a major message in my art practice for the last uh, since 2013, at least. Um, when the performances started, something. When I started, started, started working on body-based, mm. movement-based mm. work. Right? Mm. Um, so, if if you look at if you look at these paintings and. Many of these paintings, to me, are reminiscent of the kind of imagery that I was exposed to as a child. The Sikhs, and I was uh, brought up as a, a Sikh, they had to fight for their space, their place in this world from 17th century onwards, and, and, and they were per persecuted quite a lot. They had to fight to, to exist. Mm. So our history is a bloody one. Mm. You know, seeking a lot of war, a lot of conflict, a lot that I grew up seeing and knowing mm. from these four or five prints that sat in our living room, mm. sometimes for 20, 30 years, never changed. And a lot of them were beautifully rendered uh, works that were made by artisans, you know, from um, Punjab, I Punjab, guess. And, yeah. and, 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 and young painters that were copying other painters and mm. copying others. And and I stipulate in this exhibition that much of this was came from many of the battle scenes and war paintings from the 15th, 16th century, you know? And 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 as in some ways I'm suggesting to you that even the visuals that we are exposed to have been mm. colonized. Not just our sounds, not just our bodies, but even the, the visual imagery that works around us has been colonized no, of by, by our old dead masters. Oh, but, well, well, what we've been exposed to in terms of art history, right? When we think about art history, exactly. what we yes. schooled in art history, yes. we're schooled in Western art history, exactly. mostly, I, isn't it? I mean, I mean I, I, my 13-year-old my daughter is a, a resident expert on Greek gods and Roman gods. She knows everything about mm. Greek and Roman mythology. Yeah. She, she, has very, she knows very little about Sikh. the culture. But Sikh gods, <laughs> the, in, I mean, we gods, in the gods. East have got many, many more 
stories Absolutely. and myths Absolutely. about. And, and, and there aren't enough books that makes it available for a 13 year old to this learn about uh, the Eastern, you know, East, East, Eastern myths and stories and mythology. Exactly. So I, you know, I, I'm just, I'm just raising that point, this, this simple point about my, my search for the sound that described me amidst all the other noise, mm. you know, right? the search for the sound that describes my culture and my history, mm. and my search for the visual that has been exposed to so much that is Western. So many of these, many of these uh, visuals that you come, that you see in this exhibition, well, immediately I'll make you ask, why is he painting white people? Why is he painting? It looks as though, yeah. <laughs> you know, Western, Western diorama, Western, Western diorama. Yeah. Much of this, you have to, if you, if if you know the what I grew up with, you'll come to understand how it's all complicit. Mm. You know, that it's all kind of intertwined. Absolutely. And, yeah. and I, these, this, these visuals remind me of what I grew up with. You know. Yeah. No, I think no. It's. I mean, that, that, I think that's where I think the link is very clear now. But obviously, on porn, just looking at work mm. originally, mm. you might not make that mm. that connection, mm. right? Mm. Okay. And I think the final question, really, I mean, you know, in terms of how these works have, have sort of linked, say, to your last series, which was six years ago, to Cater Deliverance. Maybe mm. you could just. Tell us a little bit about how the Cage of Deliverance has sort of you know, segued into this. So, a Cage of Deliverance was an investigation into, again, the space and shape of our bodies and how it's, if somebody's always interfering with the way our bodies shaped as we walk through this world, as we move through life, and you know, there's always some kind of power. That, that constrains or takes away from the space that we occupy. You know? mm. And that, that, that my, my, the, the cage of deliverance was, was worked around this idea of, of, of how worship primarily, the rituals that we, that, that we involve with day to day, the rituals shape us, the, the, the things that we do and how we do them, and the kind of things that we do again and again. For instance, one of the things that kind of uh, that that is perennial through our through my work mm. is turpentine. Mm. It's, it's a piece of fabric that's connected intimately with a gesture and a rhythm, a set of movements, you know. And it to me is like a prosthesis. The turban to me is like mm. it's half in this world, half in some other world, the world of gods. It's kind of like an antenna. It's kind of like something that, an armor that you put on that, that, that makes you almost godlike, you know, almost half god. You know, we always, as Sigmund Freud said, you know, constantly trying to emulate our gods, you know. And in some ways, um, what I was trying to explore was what is it that has colonized us? What is it that is affecting the shape and space of our bodies? Which is what I'm doing here. Mm -hmm. Which is which is which runs through all my uh, all my work that I've been doing for the longest time longest time now. The lines that are drawn with our bodies, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the lines and borders and partitions mm -hmm. that we carry within mm -hmm. us, the things that puts us on this side, on that side, that shapes us, that stops us from moving the way we must move. Mm. And so colonization does that. We need to think about what is that has colonized our bodies and how we might decolonize and how we must reflect on that. Every day, whatever we do, think about what we're doing, why we're saying this, why we're doing it, and how is it that our old masters are sitting on our shoulders guiding our, you know, guiding the way we walk through our lives. Okay, no, thank you, Jinder. Brilliant. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for wonderful. letting me do this. Wonderful to have you here. <laughs> after, after six years, yeah. Yes, you always wait so long. Next time, yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks.